Nehemiah chapter 1. This is a story, this begins the story of a man that God used in a mighty way. And uh, we're going to talk about the process of, of how this comes about. We're going to talk about the process of, of Nehemiah here and some life lessons that we can learn from him. A couple of things I believe that God has in store for us this morning. Amen? So we're going to read the, entire, the entirety of chapter 1. Um, you may notice it's not like Psalm 119. There's only 11 verses, so I think you'll be okay. All right? So here we go. Plunging in, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakali. In the month of Keslev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. He said, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Then I, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave to your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Father, today I pray, help us, God, to see with our spiritual eyes the things that you want to speak to our heart about today. Anoint me, God, and use me, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Nehemiah, in this passage of Scripture, is... Um, he has a, a role in the palace, and one day, one of his brothers, Han and I, came and, uh, wanted, and just talking with him. And you know how that goes. You've had family reunions. You've had different things that have gone on in your life. Christmas time is a good time for that. You ask, hey, how's it going? Right? What's going on? Tell me the word from the homeland. How's everybody doing? Right? And he speaks up and he says, listen, these people are in trouble. They're in great trouble and they are disgraced. And he begins to tell them about the situation. He begins to tell them about the things that are going on in Jerusalem and in the area of that, um, in, in those areas. And all of a sudden, something happens in Nehemiah in those moments. He is grabbed by the burden that is set before him. Today I want to talk about this idea of being grabbed by a burden, of being allowing the Holy Spirit to move in your life in such a way that you can't sleep at night, but allowing the Holy Spirit to move in your heart in such a way that it keeps stirring you and you can't get it off your mind, you can't get it out of your spirit, and all of a sudden what you're doing, it consumes your every thought. God, give us people who are willing to step out in faith and not just step out, but Lord, hear the call of God for people and become burdened for people. We need people who are willing to say, God, I am a vessel you use. And in the moment that they hear a need and the Holy Spirit speaks to their life, they're willing to make a difference. There are a couple things I notice about these, some lessons here today. And the first one is this. With Nehemiah, he starts with the why. He starts with the why. I don't know if you're like me. <laughs> I like the why. Why? But I also like it to be connected to the how. Right? If you're like me, that's the case. You're like, man, Lord, 
I, I get the why. What about the how? And sometimes we like to work ahead, and, and what happens is, and maybe you're like this, or maybe I'm the only one. But maybe you're like this, and, and I get the why. God's burdened me with the why, but when the how doesn't happen like I think it should, I retract from the why. I'm like, well, God, maybe it's not your timing. Maybe you didn't have it in such a way as this. There's some things I notice about this passage of Scripture. One of that is this. He hears the burden, and it causes him to weep. But it didn't just stop in a one-moment instance. It caused him to weep, but it caused him to mourn and fast and pray. And for days, he does this. And, and I, I want to draw the connection. In the first verse of chapter 1 and in the first verse of chapter 2, he gives us a little time frame here. There's months there. There are Jewish months on the calendar. And so I started thinking, oh my goodness, what is these months? How much time? There's a period of about four months here that he is praying and mourning and seeking after God because God has so burdened his heart with this. Why is the why so important? In Nehemiah's case, it's because people were living exposed. They were fearful. They were vulnerable. They were living in disgrace. And so the why is so important because the why is the thing that grabs our heart. The why is the thing that grabs a hold of us and says, I'm not going to let go because the Spirit of God is trying to do something in me so that I can stir my heart to reach someone. It's the why that grabs your heart. When the Holy Spirit places a vision, when He places a burden, when He places a responsibility inside of you, that is the why that should drive us. I think in our society, especially in our American society, as it relates to the church, we've gotten so focused on the things of us and we've gotten so focused with just the status quo that we aren't driven anymore by the burden and by the why. How do you say that, Pastor? How can you make that statement? Because there are people every day in Byesville, Ohio, in Cambridge, Ohio, in Floor City, Ohio, in Senecaville, Ohio, and throughout this entire community who are dying and going to hell every day. And I challenge you, when was the last time you were burdened by that? When was the last time that that thought alone kept you up at night? I mentioned in, this first, in the first service, I've had the, I don't know if it's a privilege, but just an opportunity to minister. Um, every once in a while, I'll get a call from our funeral director and Someone will come and, and pass away, and they don't have a pastor. and I don't know them, but it's so hard to sit and to listen of stories and individuals and different circumstances that have gone on and taken place, and you know, unless God got them at the last moment of their life, that they didn't spend eternity with Jesus. And that's one of the hardest things I can tell you right now that I, have, that I do as a pastor. It's in those moments that God grips my heart again. You know, one of my prayers is I've been praying is, is this, uh, oh, since Father's Day, this is just this, this thought process and this message has just kind of been culminating in my heart and in my spirit. And one of the things that I, I want as your pastor, and, and not just as your pastor, but as somebody who's in this community, I want Jesus to put such a burden on, in, in my heart for lost people that it keeps me up at night. I want God to put such a heart for somebody's soul. We talk about it in the paper. We see it across our society. We see it not only in this area, but it's, it's not just confined to right here. It's a global thing. And, and we, we go to bed and we just wake up and we go through our day and we get so accustomed to our schedules and our agendas and our stuff that we lose sight of people. God, help me with that. I never want to get to the place where I forget the why. 
There are people who need Jesus. And as my brother so eloquently said, there are people who need to hear it, and the only way they're going to hear it is from you. They're not necessarily banging down the doors of churches. They're waiting for someone to share the gospel message with them. There are people in your family. There are people that we work with. There are people that we commune with at schools. There are people that we rub elbows with in our society. And they're waiting to see. They may see Jesus in you, but they're waiting for you to expose them to what He is and who He is. The burden. You know, it's, it's the burden that's causing the right family to go to Columbus and reach the group that they're reaching. It's not because they thought Columbus was a cool place to live. I lived there for five years. It's not all that cool. I'm just saying. It was all right, but, you know, nothing special. Why is he doing that? Why would he leave the ministry that God had him in? Because God had placed a burden in their life. He'd give them a vision and it put it in their heart to do what he's doing. It's the why. Nehemiah's why is the thing that weighs heavy on him. It's the thing that he thinks about. It's the thing he prays about. He can't get it out of his mind and he can't get it out of his heart. So let me ask you this question. Is there a why factor for you? Is there a why for you? What is the burden that you have? It's been my experience that God's waiting with a why for each of us. But the reason we often miss it is because A, we don't want to hear it. B, we're scared of it. Or B, we aren't in a place where God can speak it. C, A, B, C. Even in Indiana, that works. A, B, C. A, we often don't hear, we don't want to hear it. B, we're scared of it. Or C, we're not in a place where God can speak it to us. It starts with the why. The second thing is this. It, you've got to, it takes courage to step out into the why and to leave your comfort. Nehemiah, the very last words of chapter 1, it says this. He was cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer in those days was a pretty important role. Because you see, the kings in those days, they were assassinated a lot. And the way that people would do it, they wouldn't necessarily come up to the king with a knife or sword or some kind of uh, weapon. They would try to poison him through his drink. And so what the cupbearer would do is the cupbearer would take the drink from before the king got it. He would take a drink, and if he lived, then the king would drink after him. Somebody like, Gross. Secondhand spit. Disgusting. Well, you learn to like it or be dead, right? And so the cupbearer's responsibility was great, but as long as everything was at peace and there was no assassination attempts, it was probably a pretty cushy job. I mean, let's be real. All you have to do is come in, sip the cup. Oh, it's good. I'm still walking around. I still feel good. All my extremities work. That's a pretty good glass right there, king. Have at it. Where's my plate? Where's my room? And you live in the palace and you have all the luxuries of palace life. You had all the perks of being a state official. But one day when he just pops the question to one of his brothers, how are things going? And he responds, that burden gripped his heart so much that it changed his entire demeanor. And he had to have the faith to step out into that opportunity. Crazy thing is, the king even notices Nehemiah by his demeanor. If you go on to read chapter 2, it says, Man, why, why do you look so sad and you're not even sick? What's wrong with you? You've been moping around here for months. What's going on? And Nehemiah has the courage at that point to step out in faith and say, This is my chance. You know, he could have said, Okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. No, it's nothing. I just got some news from back home, but I'm, I'm good. It's cool. But no, he doesn't stay in the cushy life. Instead, he takes a step of faith. What do you do with a chance? That was a message I got a chance in a couple weeks ago to speak to our teenagers. What do you do with a chance? Every one of us, God has an opportunity for you to hear from the Lord and be burdened with something for God. 
And then he's going to give you opportunity to step out in faith to see it happen. Can I ask you, does it freeze you or does it free you? Does it freeze you or does it free you? If it freezes you, you're, not, you're just going to step back and I can't do this. This is crazy. This is nuts. I can't take a chance on this. This is awful. God, give me another. Or, or here's, here's the good one. It's like Gideon. Remember Gideon, the story of Gideon? He puts out the fleece and he says, okay, God, here's what I'm going to do. God, if this is you, right, if this is what you're putting in my heart, I'm going to put this fleece out here. And he says, I want the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. And God, next morning, comes up, the fleece is wet and the ground's dry. And then Gideon says, well, God, if it's surely you, and I'm not positive. About it. And so many times we do this too, because don't look at Gideon like he's some kind of weirdo. All right, because you do the same thing too. It just doesn't look like fleeces. And so many times we'll put the fleece down. And say, oh, okay, God, now that you did that, well, let's reverse the process. If this is really you, let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. And he wakes up the next day and the fleece is dry and the ground is wet. And so he's like, okay, this has got to be God. But what do I do here? God says, I want you to go fight this battle. He says, great, let's get all the guys together. Let's go fight this battle. Come on, let's go. And God says, you got too many men. And how many of you know when you're going to find a battle, there's no such thing as too many men? Anybody play the game of risk? If you play the game of risk, you know, man, when I, when I want to go attack somebody, I've got all my men, whoosh, right there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe you out. Right? I'm not going to attack a, a fortified city with two little armies. Man, I'm going after you. But God says, you got too many men, you need to get rid of them. And so he does this thing and says, okay, um, with the drink and the dog and lapping and, and thing, read it, all right? Um, I'm paraphrasing because of time, and I've got a whole lot more sermon to preach, and we're getting there fast, all right? So at the end of the story, Gideon ends up with 300 men to go fight this battle that God calls him to fight. And he knew God was telling him to do it because of the fleece and everything that happened with it. And so he's like, great, I'm in this. God, you've spoken to my heart, and I've had the courage to at least put this fleece out. Now it takes a real form of courage to take these 300 guys and go actually do what you've called me to do. Now some of you have been in that situation. God's placed a burden on your life. He's placed something in your heart, and you've put the fleece out, and you said, oh yeah, it was God, so now I've got to, what do I do now? Oh man, it was God. Oh, Jesus, what's going to happen? And you get all the way to the place where God says, I've spoken to your heart. I've given you this, 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 and this. I've told you what to do. I've placed a burden inside of you. Now it's time for you to go. And you're like, you freeze. Does the vision God's given you freeze you? Or does it free you? Does it freeze you or does it free you? Do you have the courage to step out? You see, for Nehemiah, the courage was not only to leave the comforts, it was also the courage to ask the king. Because the king should have said, no way, Jose. Or the way we use it in our house, wrong song, ding dong. That ain't happening. Go back to being your cupbearer. But he had, he, in the end of his prayer, he says, give me favor in the presence of this man, the king. Why? Because I have been praying. I have been seeking after you. I have put you first. And I, I feel that this is you, God. And when it comes time for me to take this step, God, I want your favor. And I want courage to be able to step forward and to do it. And can I tell you? The same story and principle that was the same for Nehemiah is the same for you. God's placing something in your heart. He's placed something, and if he hasn't yet, you know, I've been praying all week long that he will. And I'm going to ask you to do the same. I'm going to ask God to this week begin to speak a 
burden into your life. Speak something that is, it, it just keeps you up at night. It's a ministry thing. It's a family member. It's a, a co-worker. It's a student that you go to school with. It's somebody that you know. It's something that's going on in our society. It's something that God has a plan to use you in. And I'm going to pray that he speaks forth into that, into your life. And when he does that, just like the brother that came to speak to Nehemiah, it so grips your heart that it won't let go. And then I'm going to pray you have the courage to step forward and do it. Faith without works is dead. It's important that we move forward. What's keeping you from accomplishing the thing that God has burdened your heart with? Is it the lifestyle you're living is it the reputation that you fear you might lose? Is it the fact that you're questioning that God, that it's even from the Lord? It takes courage to step out in faith. God's calling you to not be so concerned with the comfort that you neglect the vision, that you neglect the why that he's speaking into your life. I'm going to share a story of a man that I know. Um, his name is Paul Hendrickson. And Paul was in my home church back when I was a teenager and growing up and received the call of God on my life. And Paul got the same call. The only difference was I was a teenager and Paul was in his late 40s. Had a job, had a family, had a house, had two teenage girls. Man, he, he, was, he had everything that society would say, man, you got the American dream. There is such a thing. And Paul got on his face before God, and God burdened him with this thought, I've got something for you to do. I'm calling you into the ministry. I've got something that I, I want you to go train, and I want you to go study. I want you to take this next step. And I'm sure my brother Paul, he put all kinds of fleeces out. He said, God, is this really you? Because you're talking, this isn't just a leading the Bible study at work. This isn't just a, a little step. This is a big one. You're talking about uprooting my family and driving 400 miles to go to college. And I watched him as he just prayerfully went through it. It was like God was calling him, so he was sure of it. And he said, you know, we would go, when I was in, I lived on campus, I lived in the dorm, and he lived in married student housing, and occasionally we'd go down and just hang out with him when he was available. But one, you know, the thing that he never said, he said, you know what? In this whole journey, I don't, regret, I don't regret saying yes to Jesus. I don't regret saying yes to God and stepping out in faith and encouraging and doing it. No matter what the circumstances look like, no matter how crazy it was to uproot my whole family and to quit my job and to sell my house, all of that stuff was, would have been nuts in the human mindset. But in doing so and just stepping out in faith, I don't regret that one bit because God's met me here. And I know that God has a plan for my life takes courage to do that. There's another passage of Nehemiah that I wanted to hit today. I didn't do this in the first service, so you guys get the bonus. How about that? Right? Crazy clock interrupted in the first service, but you guys don't care about clocks. <laughs> I won't be super long. My children's church workers probably care about clocks. It's in Nehemiah chapter 4. And this is a word I just felt like God gave me for some of us today, especially some of the men in the room. Because you need to become burdened for your family. You need to become burdened for the people around you. The context of chapter 4 is Nehemiah is there and they're in the process of trying to rebuild the wall and they're facing some really tough opposition. Completing the vision, the why has become difficult and enemies are conspiring to thwart this effort by threatening to invade and stop wall production and uh, mainly just using fear tactics. And so Nehemiah has to pull some people off the wall to, to cause them to, to uh, stand guard and, and to watch while others work and kind of a, a back and forth kind of thing. And 
In verse 14 of chapter 4, he's trying to give them a, a pep talk, if you will, about this whole situation. And it says this, and it, it, if you're a guy here today and you've got your Bible with you, I encourage you to, to highlight this verse. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Do not, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Nehemiah is forced to rely on men who have various amounts of military prowess and experience to defend the people. Every man is going to need to be a line of defense against the enemy's invasion. Invasion into their home, invasion into the community. And can I just share with you today that that call is still the same for all men. We need men to be the line of defense in their home. Not just physically, but spiritually as well. We need to hear this cry and claim this burden because for far too long men have needed to do this, but we've neglected that role. So guys, I tell you, and I, can, I, can, uh, uh, I acknowledge you in this, fight for your wives. Fight for your kids. Fight for your church. The enemy has lulled us into a place of complacency, and as it relates to our spiritual lives, and we are being put in a place where God is trying to reveal a vision for us that says revival starts at home. A move of God and a burden has to start in your home. It will reach there before it ever reaches here. And if we don't take the role seriously of saying, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I'm going to fight for my wife. I'm going to fight for my kids. I'm going to fight for my brothers and sisters. The enemy has lulled me to sleep for long enough, and I need to have my focus. I need to have my vision. I need to collect this burden and say, God, this is not just something that you have... Uh, tossed at me. This is something I am going to grab a hold of. I'm going to live. I'm going to preach. I'm going to do. I'm going to be the person that you've called me to be. And I'm going to fight. We like to fight physically sometimes, don't we? Anybody ever fight in school? Come on now. A few of you honest people. We like to fight. Why do we fight physically? Because, man, something's wronged us. Somebody's attacked us. And we see that attack, and it's easy to respond physically. Man, come on, man. Let's go. Right? It's easy to, when, when somebody's attacking in your home to physically be able to do that. But can I tell you, the enemy of your soul has been attacking home and maybe even your home for years and you've sat by and done nothing because you've not recognized it, because you've not been burdened by it, because you've allowed it to happen. And God is saying, listen, men. It's time. I'm calling up for men of God. I'm calling for men of God who will fight for their kids, who will fight for their grandkids, who will fight for their wife, and say, as for me and my kids and my family, not only will we serve the Lord, we'll have a passion for God, and I'm going to allow my kids to go to the places wherever God calls them. I'm not going to try to hoard them into my own. I'm going to lead them into what God wants them to do in their life. I ask you this question. When was the last time, or maybe ever, have you set spiritual goals for your family? Maybe you've set physical goals and that you're planning on how to send your kids to college, and maybe you're working on a budget to maybe go on that vacation, or maybe you've set some physical goals that maybe you're working on different things to try to get out of work a little bit more. But oftentimes we get consumed with schedules, work, and stuff, and we're distracted. And lulled to sleep about setting any spiritual goals for your family. You know, I had some spiritual goals for my family, and I'm, I'm just going to share them with you. Um, and I'm just, just being transparent today. I, I've not been perfect at these. But I'm trying my hardest because I recognize the need to fight. 
I want my kids, one of my goals was I wanted my kids to experience a mission trip before they graduated from high school. I wanted them to see what missions was like. I wanted to see what, that there's a world beyond Byesville, Ohio that they needed to reach. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful to God that I've been able to do that. And I think those kind of moments create spiritual experiences in the hearts of my kids. I want to instill and model worship, a strong devotional life. I want to be a warrior in prayer and point my family, not just by word, but by example on what it means to love and serve God. That's a goal of mine. I don't want to just say it. I want to live it. I don't want to do it. I want my kids to not be afraid to answer the call of God. Not only for their lives, but for the lives of their children. And I want to demonstrate what it looks like to have discussions with them about taking one step at a time with the Lord. I want to talk about God's plan for their life. I want to be able to have those discussions. When God speaks to their heart, I want them to feel like they can come to me and we can talk about these things. And we can nurture and pray together. Another goal of mine was I want my kids to have every experience with camp and youth and conventions and rangers and girls clubs and children's church. I wanted them to experience and hear and respond, not just hear and experience, but I wanted them to be able to respond to God's why question for their life. And that can happen. And my last one that I had was I want my wife to grow in the Lord and have her experience growth opportunities with Jesus. I wanted to pray with her, not just for her. How many of you know there's a difference? That's a tough one, isn't it? I wanted to pray with her, not just for her. To talk about spiritual things, to create an atmosphere in our home that honors God and reflects that he's the top priority of my life. Can I ask you a question today? Have you ever done something like this in your family? I'm not saying I'm perfect, because there are times and I've blown it on some of these. But I've prayed to the Lord and asked him to forgive me. Keep coming back to it. Keep coming to it. A military power may not be attempting to breach the walls of your house. But make no mistake, the enemy is on the attack. He's looking for someone to devour. He's looking for someone to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I challenge you with this thought. How committed are you to fight him? To fight for your wives. To fight for your sons and daughters. To fight for your church and your community. How precious to you are the people in your home. If you're wondering what your why is, I can guarantee you, man, that's one of them. God's called you to do that. And so this morning, as we close our time together in prayer, I know that was an add-on, but I just felt burdened in my heart that I was supposed to share that this morning. Maybe you're here and, and you'd say, you know what? I want to receive that mantle. Maybe you're a man here today and you say, man, I want, I want to receive that mantle. I, I, I accept that, God. I'm going to set, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for my wife. I'm going to fight for my kids, my grandkids. I'm going to fight the enemy of my soul who's trying to destroy me. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my home, we're going to set godly principles. As for me and my home, I'm going to stand guard, and I'm going to watch, and I'm not going to just let things just happen. I'm going to stand guard over my home, and I'm going to say, devil, you have no place here, because this house belongs to Jesus. It's his. And you're here today, and you be a man, and you say, you know what? I'm going to accept that man in just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. But I want to pray first. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, I pray for every man that's in this room, that's influenced in family members. I pray, God, today, right now, that you would speak to their hearts. 
in Jesus' name. You're here this morning, and that's you, man. I want to be that kind of man. I want to be the guy who speaks life over my family. I want to fight. I want to fight for my kids. I want to fight for my wife. I'm going to fight to see the kingdom of God advance in my family. I'm going to set spiritual goals. I'm going to try my best to fulfill what God's called me to do. And I'm going to have courage to step out today. And I'm going to have courage to take this step and say, Lord, I'm going to give you my life. And I'm going to give you this give you this, my, my home. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to be the man that you've called me to be. I'm going to be a priest in my house. If that's you today, as a man, I want you to stand right now. If that's you today, I want you to stand. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to be the man of God in my house. And will be the man in my house. That way you have no business in my home. Hallelujah. Father, right now, I pray for every man that's standing. I pray for strength for them. I pray that you would lead them and guide them. Some of them... Yeah, every, as I look across the room, there are those who are different stages of life. But God, every one of us is an influencer. Every one of us has people that are under our care. And God, today we make a commitment. We stand up and we make a commitment that says, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for my wife. I'm going to fight for my kids. I'm going to fight for the kids that maybe I don't even have yet. But I'm going to fight. And I'm going to be the one that, God's, that God can use. I'm going to set spiritual goals. I'm going to thwart the enemy in my house. I'm not going to let things into my home that would cause my family to stumble. I'm not going to let things into my life that would cause them to chase after things that are not of you. But God, I'm going to set the example. I'm going to pray for, but I'm also going to pray with. I'm going to move and I'm going to see God, you do great things. I'm going to set spiritual goals. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Let the power of the Holy Spirit right now fill these men. And God, just like you anointed David to take down Goliath, God, I pray that that kind of same anointing to kill giants, that kind of same anointing to kill the enemy, God would raise up in these guys right now in Jesus' name. And God, as they rush to the battle, I pray that they understand that it's not won by spears, it's not won by military might, it's not won by physical attributes, but the victory is ours when the battle is the Lord's. And God, you've called us to stand and you've called us to fight, and that's what we're going to do. Let the anointing of, of that kind of anointing flood their heart, God, today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I invite everyone to stand, if you would, please. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you say, you know what, I, I pray that God, maybe God's burdened you with something. Maybe that's something to, uh, when, when you go back to school or something that God's placing on your heart. It's a, it's a burden that... that keeps you going. It's, it's something that, that drives you. It's something that is, is, is inside of you, but you've lacked the courage to step out and to move forward with it. And today, if that's you, would you just raise your hand to the Lord and say, God, I want to pray for courage today. We're going to do that for you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, for those folks that are needing courage today to step out to do what you've called them to do, Father, in the name of the Lord, I pray, let the power and might and anointing of the Holy Spirit, God, be with them to take that leap of faith to take that step that says, I'm going to do that thing that you've called me to do. I'm not going to sit back and wonder. I know it's a burden from you. I know that you're speaking into my life. And so God, because of that, I'm going to take a step. And God, today I pray, give us courage to do so. And maybe the last, this last group, maybe you're here today and man, you've just kind of been on cruise control in your life. And God's wanting to speak something to you. He's wanting to give you, it doesn't matter your age. I, I, I get, we get so caught up in, man, I, let, let the younger folks do that or, or do, uh, that's, I'm not mature enough for that or, or back and forth. And, and what happens is neither one, nobody approaches the Lord for a burden. And so today you'd say, God, I, I want to come to you. I, I need you to speak into my life. 
I want to be consumed with something that you have for my life. And I want to follow you and do what you've called me to do. So if that's you this morning, would you lift up your hands to the Lord? And Father, right now, I pray for those folks that need just a, a move of you to happen in their heart right now. We've been praying all week that you would speak to them, and we're going to continue to do so. Burden our heart, God, with what burdens yours. Help us to see what you would have us to do. For some, it might be something that you've called them to do in a ministry. For some, it might be something that you've called them to do in their community. But God, for all of us, it's about reaching people. So God, I pray in the name of Jesus, burden our heart with that thing that burdens yours. And show us, God, what you would have for us to do. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, God, today. I ask, God, throughout this week, Lord, that you would begin to give us visions, that you begin to give us, uh, God, just a, a Holy Spirit inklings and, and, and words of affirmation of what you want us to do and the things and ministries you have for us lined up to go. And, and God, I believe that there are things that are going to open up this week. There are people that are going to feel uh, the Word of God and the power of God speak to their heart, and things are going to happen, I believe, in spiritual places this week. We've got a community that needs Jesus. We've got a, a people who need to hear, God, the good news that we have about you. Help us, God, to share that. Burden our hearts with lost people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.